Great. Good to see Louise is here too. Okay, so it's one minute past now, so I'll just uh, briefly start with an introduction um, to say good afternoon, as it's just afternoon. Welcome to everyone for joining our third Landlord webinar of 2022 today. Uh, we do these every other month um, and usually invite um, one or two guest speakers um, to give some information um, share their knowledge with um, those who are watching and those who are recording, uh, sent the recording and watching the recording afterwards. So um, I'm Dawn Clark. For those who don't know me, um, Lettings and Property Management Director at Knock Dighton with over 30 years experience in the Shropshire and Worcestershire lettings market. Today I am joined by Graham Loosley, who is a specialist property tax advisor and partner of Mercian Accountants who are based in Shrewsbury. Those who have joined or watched this webinar previously will have seen Graham before. This is his third time um, back by popular demand. Uh, Graham has many landlord clients and is very knowledgeable about property related tax and how to minimise your tax based on your own personal circumstances. Uh, Graham will be talking today about tax returns. Secondly, I will be joined, I'm joined by Craig Tollins. Craig is a domestic energy assessor by trade and has been working closely with local authorities and various estate agents to insulate people's homes and provide solutions to increase their property's energy efficiency using eco-funding and with the government's intention to reduce minimum EPC ratings to a C from April 2026. I thought it might be useful for Craig to share some of his knowledge and experience with us. Before I hand you over to our first guest speaker, just wanted to update you with some new legislation that's been published this week uh, to amend the current smoke and carbon monoxide regulations from the 1st of October 2022. Uh, currently, we were expecting this, and currently the regulations only require landlords to fit carbon monoxide detectors to um, rooms with solid fuel burning appliances such as a log burner or a coal fire from the 1st of October at the start of any new or renewed tenancy landlords will be expected to have a carbon monoxide detector uh, fitted in every room with a fuel burning appliance um, which includes gas oil uh, boilers uh, gas fires, uh, the only exception to this are rooms where the only combustion appliance is a gas cooker. If a landlord is notified by a tenant of a defective smoke or carbon monoxide alarm, the amended regulations also require landlords to investigate and repair or replace the item as soon as reasonably possible. And it also applies to HMO licenses um, any licenses that are issued or renewed on or after the 1st of October will include a condition in line with these regulations also. Um, just a brief update as well on the, um, on the sales and lettings markets. Uh, figures that we've obtained from Rightmove show that on the sales side, uh, the national average asking prices are still going up um, over the last year. Um, there's been, um, on average, over the country, it's a 9.9% increase. Um, just relating more locally to the West Midlands region, um, it's actually 10.7% increase in average asking prices, um, and with the average price being 276000 um, And also on the lettings, um, the, for quarter one, 2022, the annual change in rental asking prices is up by 10.8% um, since this time last year. And more locally, West Midlands, it's 10.3%. And the average rent is now £963. Um, so, yes, market is still very, very buoyant. There is still a shortage of properties um, to um, sell and to let. Um, so again, that is uh, having that effect and driving up the property prices on both sides. Um, so back to the webinar, um, all those attending the live presentation today will have the opportunity to ask the speakers questions. Um, please pop them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen um, and I will read them out and ask the speakers the questions then. 
Um, and so without further ado, I will hand you over to Graham. Hello, Graham. Hello, Dawn, and um, welcome to the webinar. Shall I start my slides up? Yes, um, oh, we should be able to share your slides. So from here, share screen. Oh, um, don't have permission just yet. Yeah, I'm just changing that now. Who can start sharing? Right, okay. Can you Thank do that you. now? That's done. So let's just put the screen over here. And let's get the other screen here. Okay, so this webinar is going to go over self-assessment tax returns for landlords. There's an awful lot to cover. I'm going to try to be brief. We will make the text content of the presentation available afterwards. And of course, we're always happy to help with any questions. So a, a couple of the most interesting parts of the presentation about myself. Um, I was actually due to run the Manchester Marathon in April and missed it because of COVID. So I've re-entered um, and now running the London Marathon in October. And if running marathons isn't sufficiently embarrassing, my other hobby is metal detecting. I'm a partner in Mercy and Accountants. We are a, a friendly family firm of tax specialists based in Shrewsbury and we act for many, many landlords um, locally and across the whole country. The usual disclaimers apply. Um, I'd be happy to advise anybody who is watching the presentation today, but of course the presentation is only for information purposes only, and it is categorically not to be, not to be considered advice. So before taking any action or refraining from any action, please take advice that is appropriate to your individual circumstances. So we have a self-assessment tax system in the UK. Um, we have a very complex system and I'm going to try to cover some of the main points as they apply to landlords. And we're going to try to do that in the next 20 to 25 minutes. Um, for those who um, start to nod off partway through the presentation. Um, it's all about landlord tax returns. So we have um, variable rates of income tax in the UK, and we have bands of income to which those tax rates apply. Many clients for whom I act um, try to keep their incomes under the 50,270 threshold so they don't get forced into the higher rates of tax. And um, of course, tax can get much, much higher. You may have heard about the new health and social care levy in the press, the 1.25% that's being added to the tax paid on dividend income and to employee and also to employer national insurance. But that fortunately does not apply to landlords on their rental profits. But we are living through difficult times and I really don't envy the, the policymakers, the choice that they're facing. Um, there are rumours of tax cuts, but who knows um, what may happen. But it's a certainty that allowances were frozen um, for a five year period. So for income purposes, we may earn up to £12,570 before um, any tax is paid. The filing deadlines for self-assessment are quite strict and there is a particularly unpleasant penalties regime around this. Um, in the, the year that has just been filed, because of the pandemic and COVID, the deadline was extended temporarily by a month, but we can't be at all certain that this extension will apply in the coming year. So for the tax year we're currently in, which is the 2022 23 tax year, that's going to be January of the year after next. And the tax year that has just ended on the 5th of April 22, the filing deadline for that will very likely be the 31st of January um, next year. 
But that, of course, assumes online filing. Um, I do come across cases where people still file on paper, but I think the numbers are rapidly dwindling and we expect that soon paper filing will no longer be an option. There are um, different deadlines for paper filing. Um, if you want to file on paper, then it's October, but most people work to the January deadline. And of course, the tax year still ends on the 5th of April. Even though there's been a large consultation on this, we haven't had a decision. Um, it's taking a long time to decide, should we move the 5th of April back to the 31st of March? Or indeed, should we go for a calendar year? And we, we simply haven't had any firm news on those changes. So for the time being, our tax year ends on the 5th of April, although most accountants will round off to the 31st of March for accounts and tax returns purposes. And most people have to file their tax return by the 31st of January following. There are some slightly earlier deadlines, though, if you are a landlord and also in receipt of employment or company pension income, and you wish to have HMRC collect your tax liability through your PAYE tax code, provided the tax is less than £3,000, you do need to file your returns um, online about a month earlier if you wish for them to, to, to collect tax that way. There's a whole um, set of penalties around self-assessment. Um, if you miss the deadline of midnight on the 31st of January, it's an automatic £100. We are now in the very expensive time of year for those who have not yet filed the tax return that was due at the end of this February because we have £10 daily penalties for a 90 day period. And there are two further penalties of £300 each for those who get to be very late with their filing. And it can actually add up to £1,600 total penalties for one tax year, even if the tax payable ends up um, being nil. So we have a very expensive penalties regime for those who are late. We have a, a system of payments on account. Um, because we don't pay tax on self-assessment until much longer um, than the end of the tax year, we actually end up with a system where we pay tax in two instalments each year. I shan't go into the details of this uh, on the presentation because the, the calculations can be quite complicated. But broadly speaking, if you're in self-assessment and you have substantial self-assessment tax to pay, you will find yourself making two payments per year one at the end of January and another at the end of July, and that's a, an annual system. And as well as the penalties that apply for late filing, there are, of course, also pay penalties for late payment in addition to interest. So we have a 5% penalty for those who are late paying the January instalment and that they still haven't paid by um, July, there is a further 5% penalty. Um, but something we always recommend to clients who are in difficulty making payments to HMRC is to talk to them about a time to pay arrangement, because if we have a time to pay arrangement in place, then penalties can be stopped. But of course, the interest doesn't stop running and will always be payable. So getting into the self-assessment tax return itself, we actually have potentially four different property sections to complete for a landlord. We have normal property income and we have separately furnished holiday lets and we have to split it again between the UK and properties outside the UK. Now for normal properties, those can be anywhere in the world. Furnished holiday lets are only possible in the European economic area. And if you have what would be a furnished holiday let outside of the European economic area, then you have to treat it as a normal property. So normal property lettings would include the conventional assured shorthold tenancy and would also include the, the house in multiple occupation, but specifically does not include a furnished holiday let. We have to think about property ownership as well because um, taxation can follow legal ownership. And there are two ways to own property in the UK. Um, there is the concept of joint tenancy and tenants in common. 
and they have different different consequences. So if anybody is not clear on this point, please take advice from your lawyer or your friendly accountant and, and they will help you with this. If you find you have joint tenancy, which often is, is the wrong choice for tax efficiency, it is possible to convert to a tenancy in common holding with a procedure called a severance of tenancy, which actually is quite, quite an easy process to go through. So getting onto the specifics of tax returns, if you are owning a property jointly with another person, then you need to tell HMRC that on your tax return. And you must also disclose on your tax return the name of the person who is responsible for keeping the property records. As to how you share the income between you, if you own the property as joint tenants, then it's equal shares. And with tenants in common, it's possible to change that to an unequal share, but there are some further complications for those who are married couples or civil partners with some additional paperwork required. But it's actually a very, very common, very popular tax saving technique for couples who are married or civil partners to start moving the income to the partner who faces the lower rate of tax. We often end up with couples wishing to make gifts within the couple to achieve tax efficiency. A couple of um, points to watch out for here. If it's a mortgage property, you must always speak to the lender because of course it's their property. And there's no capital gains tax chargeable if you are a married couple or civil partners. But if you're a cohabiting couple, that, that exemption does not apply. And there wouldn't be stamp duty if no money changes hands unless it's a mortgage property, in which case stamp duty will apply on the mortgage balance. And the 3% surcharge on stamp duty we pay for investment properties does not apply to gifts between couples. But if you're gifting more than one property, watch out for them being linked together as linked transactions. So getting into some um, pretty hardcore accountancy now, we have two ways in which to prepare the, the rental accounts and calculate the rental profits. On the cash basis, it's pretty much the money in the tin, the money that went through the bank statement. And on the accruals basis, it's the money that should have been received and the expenses that were due to be paid, whether they were in fact paid at all. Now, many people follow the cash basis because it's convenient, but there can be times when the accruals basis is better, can produce a better outcome. And of course, those who hold their properties as limited companies or limited liability partnerships do not have the option to use the cash basis. They must use the accruals basis. Now, as an example where the accruals basis might be a better, might produce a better outcome for a landlord who has used the cash basis in the past, um, consider a situation where there's a repair expense that's been incurred and the invoice was dated within the tax year but it wasn't actually paid until after the tax year. On the cash basis, there's no tax relief for that expense for a whole calendar year because you're counting from when it's actually paid. But on the accruals basis, it's based upon the date of the invoice. And then there's quite a sophisticated point for the advanced students following the presentation. When we have tax years where the rate of tax is lower for the whole country or for an individual, you might actually change the basis between cash and accruals basis to drop the expenses where they're going to get a higher rate of relief. But that's that's an advanced point. Now, for landlords who have very low expenses, and I don't come across many of them in my practice, um, there is an option to claim a flat rate £1,000 allowance. It's an either or, you can't have the expenses and the allowance. But I do come across cases where people have got let property um, with minimal expenses going through. And sometimes you can actually get better tax relief by claiming the flat rate figure. Now, this is a topic which causes a great deal of confusion amongst clients. When we spend money on a property, how it's treated for tax depends upon whether it's categorized as a, a revenue expenditure or a capital expenditure. Um, revenue expenditure is broadly tax allowable against rental income. Capital expenditure is generally not. And it can be quite, it causes quite a great deal of confusion deciding what is what. So things that are definitely capital 
um, would be the cost of the property and any spending on the property which is a major upgrade for example building an extension that's clearly capital and then looking at repairs if there is a roof that's damaged by storm then the repair to the roof is clearly a revenue expense and allowable for tax but converting a loft space and, and creating extra living space would be capital um, there are some subtle differences around repairs that might be seen as an upgrade or an improvement, but actually aren't. So if you have a property where there's single glazing and you replace with double glazing, even though it is an upgrade and an enhancement, there is a concession that allows that to be treated as a repair and allowed against rental income. Um, here is a, a big trap that I see many landlords falling into. A really important question to consider when purchasing a new property is, from the day you purchased it, was the property lettable? Because if it wasn't, then HMRC's view is that any repairs that were necessary to bring the property into a lettable condition are capital and cannot be deducted from rental income and there'll be no tax relief. And that catches a lot of people out. So many landlords follow strategies where they like to buy um, dilapidated properties and then refurb and repair before letting. You have to be very careful on this point. If the property was not lettable, then HMRC may not want to allow any expenses you incurred bringing it up to standard. There have been lots of changes around expenses that are permitted within properties. Um, years ago, we used to have percentage allowances that they're, they're long gone now. Um, so if we're buying something um, for a property, then a replacement might be allowable. I'll cover that in a moment. A repair would definitely be allowable. But if it's something that's actually fixed, fixed to the property, then that may not be allowable as a repair. Um, and then we have to think about when we replace things, whether we're, we are replacing on a like for like basis or there's actually some element of upgrading. Um, because if we upgrade, then it's a capital expenditure rather than a repair expenditure. Record keeping is really important. Um, HMRC can ask to see records and they can ask questions about your tax return many years after it was filed. So we're really keen on record keeping. And even if there's expenditure you've incurred that you can't claim against your rental profits, you may eventually sell the property one day and your accountant's going to be asking you, what did you spend on the property that improved it and wasn't claimed against rental income? And it's much better to keep a file of those sorts of capital expenses as you go along. Many landlords get confused about motoring costs. Um, for using your vehicle in your property business, you can claim either a flat rate mileage allowance or you can claim a share of the cost of the vehicle, but you can't flip flop on a particular vehicle and change from one to the other as it suits you. Once you've chosen the basis, you have to stick with it. Now, coming to capital allowances, if you're producing um, your property accounts on the accruals basis, which many landlords don't, um, then you can claim capital allowances, which are a special tax relief on plant and machinery, such as your drill and your cleaning equipment. Um, vans, of course, get much better treatment than cars, but most um, landlords that we see are on the cash basis. And with, when you're preparing rental accounts on the cash basis, then plant and machinery is simply deducted from the property income. And that would cover things such as um, vans, computers, and tools that you use for repairs and refurbs. Um, no capital allowances on anything that's furniture or household equipment um, and there's a whole specialist topic. Many landlords will have been approached by capital allowances specialists or so-called specialists. Broadly speaking, if you have a substantial property with communal areas and there could be building wide systems or lifts and that sort of thing, then there might be some further tax relief to investigate, but not for many small properties. And then we have the new replacement domestic items relief. We can um, claim for the replacement, but we can't claim for the first one. And we can only claim for the replacement if it's an equivalent replacement 
rather than an upgrade. And um, if I replace a fridge with a fridge, that's a replacement. If I reply, replace a fridge with a fridge freezer, then that's an upgrade. And um, we'd have to limit the cost to what, an up, to, to what a, a true replacement would have cost. Now, moving on to mortgage interest and George Osborne's parting gift to us landlords, section 24. Mortgage interest or residential finance costs, as they're referred to in your self-assessment tax return, are not deducted from profits. Instead, we claim a separate tax credit relating to the residential finance costs, but it's limited to 20%. So if you're a taxpayer whose income um, extends into the higher rate of tax, you're going to be paying tax at 40%, but only getting 20% relief on your interest costs. And when this first came in a few years ago, it was quite expensive for many landlords because it was effectively quite a substantial rate of tax increase. But it doesn't have any bearing if you don't pay tax at a higher rate than 20 percent. And for all of us, um, the, the interest you can claim is not the amount of interest you've paid. You can, of course, never claim relief for the capital repayment element if you have a repayment mortgage only for the interest expense. But the, the relief it can actually be limited to less than the amount of interest you've paid. Any unrelieved interest can be carried forward to a subsequent tax year. Lots of landlords fall foul of refinancing. It's perfectly possible to refinance properties and take capital out. You may then find yourself in a situation where not all of your interest on your mortgages is actually allowable as a deduction from your taxable income. So we, we see people falling foul of this quite a lot. Moving on to furnished holiday lets, there are special rules. It's quite complicated um, around furnished holiday lets, but they have different tax rules to ordinary lettings. And there can actually be some capital gains tax reliefs to furnished holiday lets that simply aren't available for ordinary property lets, including one of my favorites, which is rollover relief. We have to be careful if we make losses in our property business, we can't transfer losses from one type of business to another. Automatically, there are some restrictions on which losses can be relieved against which other business. And we can claim capital allowances for, for, for furnished holiday lets, and the concept of replacement domestic items relief does not apply if it's a furnished holiday let. Joint ownership works differently as well. Um, quite a complicated topic, probably best if you have a furnished holiday let and you're not sure that you take some advice. And indeed, there are complicated rules about is a property actually a furnished holiday let at all. There are rules around occupancy and the character of the occupancy. And we've seen lots of clients following the pandemic and being unable to let properties, having to make various elections to retain the furnished holiday let status. And moving back to tax returns generally, if you have children and you're claiming the child benefit and either of the couple has a higher income, is paying the higher rate of tax, then you're frequently going to have to pay back some or all of the child benefit. So some, some words of caution for those who are undertaking their own self-assessment tax returns. And of course, as an accountant, I would say this, wouldn't I? HMRC's manuals are extensive. They make great reading but they're not always right. Um, we've seen some recent cases before the tax tribunals where taxpayers followed the examples set out in HMRC's own manuals. HMRC then ruled against the taxpayer and the courts actually upheld the decision against the taxpayer. So even following an HMRC manual isn't any guarantee you're going to get relief. So getting towards the end of my slides, I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, it's important to look forward as well as looking back. Self-assessment tax returns are all about the past, but most landlords should have a forward look as well and think about their capital gains and inheritance tax positions. There are some protections landlords need to have in place as well. Um, have you thought about your will? Have you thought about lasting powers of attorney? And how do you plan to retire from your property business? And then looking forwards now into what may be coming down the road, and this, of course, is just entering into the realms of pure speculation. 
Um, there may or may not be tax cuts, who knows? Um, that's clearly a very contentious issue just now. We may see a tax on release from inheritance tax. We may see a tax on capital gains tax. I've been betting on that every year for the last two or three years now. And there may also be some attacks on the way that inheritance tax and capital gains tax interact. I think suffice to say, we're probably en entering into a higher tax environment, even if there are some temporary tax cuts during this cost of living crisis. Landlords need to know about making tax digital. Um, if your property income exceeds £10,000 in a tax year, not too far from now, you will have to keep computerized records and file electronic tax returns. So the question we have to, to wrap up on is, is it worth using an accountant? Well, we tend to have fewer inquiries and returns filed by accountants than those filed by taxpayers. There are lots of complicated rules that landlords often um, are not aware of. And um, there are lots of things where we can be very helpful, but of course we charge fees. Um, but the fees aren't as high as many think they might be. Um, in our firm's case, for example, landlord tax returns start from just £300. And of course, you get tax relief on our fees. So if anybody attending would like some advice, we'd be happy to assist. Of course, other firms are available. And my contact details will be available from Dawn and the team at Knock Dighton. Um, will also be in the text copy of this presentation. And if anybody's feeling generous, um, I am raising money for cancer by running a marathon. Having failed in April because of COVID, I'm going to try again in October. So any support would be much appreciated. Um, I'm going to let Dawn handle questions in a moment. And just to mention that there is a bit of a back catalogue now of presentations I've done with Dawn and her team. So if anybody's interested in knowing about landlord tax planning, the video I think is still available from back in September. I think in January we covered family investment companies. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. And Dawn, I believe I only ran overran by a couple of minutes. That's right. Thank you, Graham. Um, are you, can you stop sharing your screen? Stop sharing. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, right then. So I will go to um, questions. I'll just take it back to a gallery view. I've got um, one question, I believe, is for Craig. So we'll wait till after Craig's finished. Um, and another one, again, was EPC rating. Um, I don't think... I've only got the one above, so I'll go with that after Craig. I've got a couple of questions, actually, before I hand you over to um, Craig. Um, for you, Graham, just that I scribbled down while you were doing your um, presentation. Uh, first of all, when you're talking about revenue expenditure versus capital expenditure, you mentioned windows, and, and I'm assuming it's probably the same for doors. If you're replacing, say, a wooden door for a UPVC or a composite door, is, would that be classed as revenue expenditure repairs? That would be classed as a repair. Um, HMRC accepts that technology moves on. So perhaps back in 1960 or 1970, putting in aluminium or UPVC fixtures was considered a, a luxury and upgrade. But in current times, when we replace with modern materials, it's not considered to be an improvement. Um, it's just what most people would do. So that would be an allowable expense. Right. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and also, um, when you were talking about furnished holiday lets, um, a lot of people now are, are sort of, we're seeing more Airbnb properties around now, um, and people are doing that instead of holiday letting. Um, are, are that, is that classed, is Airbnb classed the same as furnished holiday lets when it comes to HMRC? Um, that's right. So the rules for furnished holiday lets are really about short stay accommodation. And there are some complicated rules that are in my slides, but I didn't didn't um, make you suffer going through in detail about you shouldn't have stays exceeding 31 days. The property has to be let commercially and it must be available for a number of days per year and actually let for a number of days per year to qualify for furnished holiday let status. But an Airbnb is just a particular marketing channel. The underlying use of the property is as a furnished holiday let. So whether you're on Sykes, Cottages.com or any of those big 
um, holiday letting brokers or indeed Airbnb or getting your own um, rentals directly or having your own website, it's all furnished holiday let so long as the, the, use, of the, the use of the accommodation um, qualifies under the complicated rules. Right. OK, that's good to know. Thank you for that. Um, well, that was the whistle stop tour um, for everyone there. I mean, you went through your slides very quickly and I know you've got a lot to get in there. I know and you gave you a short, a limited amount of time. Um, but I think everyone will understand really how sort of complex it is, you know, and you think you just if you've just maybe got one property, it's fairly straightforward to show your income and expenditure and do your own tax return. Well, there's obviously so much more you can actually save um, and 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 um, I suppose protect yourself from risk as well uh, by sort of having it done properly. So I would definitely recommend to everybody to contact Graham. Um, I'll pass his details on later because I think uh, it, it would benefit everyone. Uh, so thank you very much, Graham, and I will hand you over now to Craig. To talk about EPCs um, and uh, and his knowledge and experience here. So, hello, Craig. Thank you, Don. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name is Craig Tollins. Um, I've been a domestic energy assessor for the last eight or so years. Um, in that period of time, everything has changed quite substantially. Um, rules and regulations have been upgraded, downgraded, sideways and upwards. Um, EPCs that we actually produce, we use a data system called RDSAP. That stands for Reduced Data Standard Assessment Procedure. Um, as a DEA, we actually go through an accreditation scheme. So we actually use that software through the accreditation company. So it's not available to the, the average user, unfortunately. Um, the RDSAP data itself, um, basically we input details of the property. Um, so the size, shape, whether it's disconnected or connected to another property etc and all the parts of the property internally and externally go into the system. This data gets collated into this RD set and then produces a score and this is what we all see at the end of it. Um, they run from an A rated to a G rated. A rated is pretty much the perfect property, it's perfectly insulated, it's generally got renewable energy, so it can provide its own energy systems as well, like solar, air source, heat pumps, etc. cetera. Um, on a G-rated property, um, you're generally looking at something that's got very little insulation, if not none at all. Um, the windows would be single glaze, probably more than double glaze. Um, it would be a solid wall rather than a cavity or a, solid, um, a tin frame wall. Um, it varies from property to property. So the average across the UK at this present time for an EPC rated property is a D. Now, the, the issue is with landlords and renting a property at this present time, they have to be an E rated or above, which is not too difficult to get to. Um, as I said, the average property is a D rated anyway. As of 2025, the minimum energy efficiency standards, the MWS for short, is going to be upgraded to a C rated system. So the landlords around the country obviously will be in quite a high state of excitement to actually get their properties to produce this SAP rating. Um, if you cannot produce a C rated on the EPC, you will not be allowed to actually rent your property. This is going to cause a lot of problems. Um, to actually increase your EPC can be easy, but it can be difficult, obviously depending on the property. Just as a quick example, I did an EPC for a customer the other day and it came out as a D rated. They also have a numerical side to it as well. So they go from zero to 100, basically. Zero being the G rated, 100 being the A rated. Average property being a D is going to be between 55 and 68 on the scoring system. The property I produced the EPC for recently was rated as a D rated and the numerical aspect was 67. So it was literally two off a C rated. Now, looking at the rest of the property, all the bits and pieces that could or could not be done to it, it would be very, very simple for that to actually accrue a C rated simply by adding on some thermostatic radiator valves or increasing the loft insulation 
or something very similar to it. On the other hand, um, I was um, told about a property quite recently that was on an F rated and would obviously in the future have to be on a C rated in the next few years. Without actually seeing the property personally and actually going through the entire EPC, it's going to be very expensive to actually improve that to a C-rated property. Um, it would probably need thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands actually spent to actually produce this. Um, the properties themselves, the EPC, as I stated before, it depends on certain things. Um, the wall status itself, whether it's cavity or timber frame or solid wall, um, the loft obviously has a, a bearing on the APC rating, as does the heating system. This is one of the primary ones that can push your EPC rating up dramatically. Going from a 30-year-old boiler to a brand new A-rated 95% efficient boiler will increase your EPC by several points, if not a letter. So that's quite a useful thing to know. Um, windows and doors. EPC rating will not go up substantially by replacing windows and doors. A lot of people seem to think it will increase it by tenfold, but it doesn't. Um, the flooring, whether they're suspended or solid floors, again, won't increase your EPC rating too dramatically, maybe one or two points. Um, if you put renewable energy onto your house, such as solar panels, that will increase your EPC rating dramatically probably by between eight and 12 points. So that would be a massive, massive plus. As I said before, landlords at the moment have to be on E or above, will be a C or above in the next three years. Now, the efficiency standards that we have to actually comply to, everything is different and everything is changing all the time. Um, we now have to do what we call a retrofit assessment if we do any insulation works on any property. And the EPC is created prior to this and after the effect to actually show what the difference the, the measures have made to the property itself. Um, eco funding is something that I've been dealing with for many years now. Um, basically, this helps landlords out dramatically because they don't obviously want to spend thousands of pounds on the property if they don't need to. With this new minimum energy efficiency standard coming in, that is going to be something a lot of landlords are going to have to put their hands in their pockets, unfortunately, unless they go through eco-funding or something similar to it. Now, the eco-funding system as it stands at the present time was eco-3. Um, it's the energy company obligation, um, for those that don't know what eco stands for. Um, eco-4 was meant to start on April the 1st. And Parliament, unfortunately, dragged their heels and didn't sign off the paperwork in time. So Eco3 is still running in certain areas, but most have closed their doors on us. Um, there is a way around it with um, landlords who have tenants that are on benefits. They will always get free insulation works. So if somebody's on housing benefit, child benefit within reason, um, several other benefits are available. Obviously, I can pass these over to Dawn as well. So any landlords that want to know what benefit systems are available to do this, they can obviously find out. Um, when we do insulation works, of course, we do with cavity wall insulation. Um, we do loft insulation, of course. We do internal and external wall insulation for the older properties and also for timber frame properties. We also go through the government schemes to replace heating systems in tenants' properties as well. So going from standard electric convector heaters up to storage heaters, which would be the high heat retention versions, and first time central heating. So for somebody that's connected to gas, but only has an electric heating system, that sort of funding is still available as well for a brand new boiler and central heating system to go in. Now, the system when we actually produce these sorts of measures we do have to do ex extra things to the property which the government isn't currently funding we have to make sure there's adequate ventilation to the property also so for, for instance on windows there would have to be trickle vents which are little slats and they basically allow passive airflow 
And the other thing we have to do is any wet rooms that are in the property, i.e. kitchens, bathrooms, en suites, etc. We also have to make sure there are extractor fans in the property. And if there aren't, they are also supplied free of charge under the eco schemes. Um, anyone that wants to find out what schemes are still available um, in the Midlands area, we have Dudley Council area, which covers anything from North and Sedgley down to the Stourbridge area. Um, also Nottinghamshire has also got their ecosystem is still up and running. Unfortunately, the Telford Reekin area closed their doors on Eco 3, but are currently working on the basis of Eco 4 to be announced. Um, if you ever want to look up a property in your area, look up the Borough Council Eco Statement of Intent, and it will give you the criteria which you can use for this. The good thing is, is we don't actually um, go on the qualification of the landlord. We use the qualification of the tenant to actually get the free insulation or free heating system to be placed in the property. So in, in turn, obviously, of course, this saves the landlords quite a lot of money. Um, thousands in most cases, and in some cases over 10,000, if you've got enough measures to go into the property itself. Now, with these schemes themselves, I shall pass these um, parts along to Dawn also. But to give you an indication in the Dudley area at the moment, going from Sedgley down to Stourbridge, the criteria is quite a simple one. It's a net household income. And net means after tax national insurance, of course, but also taking out their mortgage, their rent, their council tax and the fuel bills they have to have a, a maximum of £21,333 in their hand for the year, which equates to around £1,700 a month. A lot of people in the Dudley and Stourbridge and Sesley area, I believe, don't have that sort of money after all these expenses are paid, so therefore they will qualify for the schemes. Um, with the affordable warmth scheme, if they're on benefits, they qualify immediately. So there's not a problem on that basis. And they do have exclusions to it as well, of course. Um, if the property is a C-rated EPC or above, they do not qualify. If it's a D or less, that's not a problem. Now, the big urgency that a lot of um, landlords are running into at the moment is Eco4, when it starts, they will not be allowed to have a property with measures installed unless it's an E rated or lower. At the present, it has to be an E rated or higher. So for most of the properties in the country which are on a D, Eco3 works, Eco4 will not. So there's a bit of a downside on that one, unfortunately. So the rush is on for Eco3 measures to be jammed in as quickly as possible. So if you are in need of obviously getting a Properties uh, measured up and insulated properly through the government schemes now is pretty much the best time to do it. All right. There are rumours in the poll in the industry as well. Um, we hope the rumours are true because they are stating that there might be a possibility of free solar coming in, which would be amazing for most people. Now, obviously. With these schemes, they can be done on private owned properties as well. It doesn't have to be tenants or landlords. So anyone out there that wants their own properties done, they can also do that as well. All right. Obviously, any questions? <laughs> right. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, I have a couple of questions here from I think they're from David. Um, said a property we own had its first EPC in 2020, an old farmhouse off the grid on LPG. We did all that was asked by the assessor, new floor, new insulation in the roof space, and that got us to an E. Talking to someone, re an air source heat pump, and they feel the rating was too low. We've since installed a new LPG boiler, which was AA rated. 
looking at the rating online and taking the government advice via the EPC register website, we're looking at improvements costing in, a, in excess of 40,000 WAV, plus losing room size um, due to, oh, sorry, 40,000 plus, losing room size due to boarding it out as no cavity. It doesn't justify the expense to save £200 per annum. It's crazy. Is it worth getting the property reassessed or any other advice? Um, well, I'm guessing they've gone down the route of trying to look at internal wall insulation, hence losing part of the room size. Um, is this a private property or is this a rented property? Sorry. Presuming it's a rented property, but I'll let David add in here. Um, while he's adding that then he's also said is the c rating law yet uh not, yeah I, I thought they'd actually might have extended that to 2026 but i might be wrong i, I did actually look because I, I know that you said 2026 the other day um yeah. so i did actually double check on that they're still saying 2025 at the moment right. so okay okay um David said currently empty, but it was rented. Right. Um, as it's currently on an E rating, um, you're allowed to rent it, so that's not an issue. Um, if the people that rent the property would qualify underneath the schemes, internal wall insulation could be done. So that would save a lot of money. Um, it's not going to get you up to a C. Um, without actually seeing the property or the EPC on the property, it's kind of difficult to tell you how much you can actually get up because it's numerical as well. Um, on an E-rated at the present, you are looking at... It's going to be from a 39 to a 54. Um, does Dave know what numerical aspect it was on the E-rating? We can ask him. Um, in the meantime, um, I have a quick question uh, relating to what you've said, but I'm going to ask it of Graham. Um, can energy efficient improvements, um, be? would they be classed as revenue expenditure or capital expenditure? Um, I'm not going to duck the question, but I think it will depend upon the circumstances. Broadly speaking, I think it's going to be... Um, an enhancement to the property could well be capital, but I think it's one of those situations where every case is going to be different. We'd have to look at the facts of each case. And I also anticipate this is going to be a very active area, and we'll probably see some cases before the tax tribunals on this as well, because as Craig um, explained in his presentation, there's quite a rush on. <laughs> and um, this is something I know a lot of landlords I speak to are concerned about. and we can expect there to be a lot of work, therefore a lot of tax claims going through, some of which may be valid, some may not be valid, and some may be in a grey area. And that's when the tax tribunals come in and we'll actually get some rulings and opinions. So I gave an answer. Right, thank you very much, Graham. Sorry to put you on the spot there. <laughs> Back to Craig. Um, have another question as well for you, Craig. Um, could you just repeat what the net household income um, would be. Right. That is actually for one particular area. That's the Dudley Borough Council. Right. Um, it's one of the active ones at the moment. The net income after bills, rent, etc., fuel bills, council tax has to be 21,333 or less. Right. Okay. So that will differ depending on which council you're looking at. It does, yeah. Um, I think I've actually encountered some councils that were left. It has to be less than 13,000 a year, which is crazy because mm -hmm. um, there's not many people on minimum wage. Right, not, okay. As If it was a, a couple in a property, you've got absolutely no hope. If they're on benefits, that's the route that we have to go down. So we, we explore all avenues. If they don't qualify on the income side, we go down the benefits side if they do have any income from benefits. Mm -hmm. um, with the schemes, we are really, really um, stamping up and down trying to get the, the energy companies to actually do something. 
um, because they're actually waiting for the government to sign off ECO4, their, their hands are tied. The fortunate thing is, if anybody wants to look up in their local area, if you go to the Dudley Borough Council, for instance, and put in eco statement of intent, and it will give you the full criteria you want to look at. If you want to look at the Telford Regan Borough Council, the same thing, eco statement of intent. And they'll actually give you a listing of what it actually involves. Right. OK, thank you for that. So David's come back and said, um, I have to provide the postcode and, and you can check. So I think it's probably best for um, us to put um, Craig and David in touch with each other, because uh, yeah. I think there's, um, there's, there's some help you can probably give to David directly um, about what he could do and some advice on, on that, what he can do to actually improve that rating and, and to get it through. Um, so I think, oh, we've got another question in the Q&A box from Jean. What are the rules for exemption from EPC requirement? Um, that's on the government website, isn't it, Craig? It is, yeah. I, I would actually go down the government website route on that one because obviously there's a myriad of different ways to do things. Um, you've got to actually jump through several hoops to actually get the exemptions correct. Um, mm -hmm. if you if you suddenly spend out loads and loads of money and you find out you've not got the exemption, you're out of pocket. In which case you might well have gone down a, an eco-funded scheme or an affordable warmth funded scheme and got it for nothing. Yeah. And yeah. I, I would always go down the funding schemes first before trying for the exemptions, simply because you don't want to pay out money that you don't need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, and Jean, if you email me, I will, um, I'll direct you to the government website as well, where it's got a list of all the exemptions uh, and the information there. But obviously, I will also be supplying um, everyone with um, a copy of the recording of this uh, webinar and contact details for both Craig and Graham. So if you've got any questions directly, um, then you can contact them direct. That's fine. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions. So uh, just putting it back to gallery view and we're almost out of time. So I'm going to say thank you both um, to Craig and to Graham. That's, that was really, found that really interesting. I hope the people that are watching have found it interesting too. And also those that are watching on um, the recording as well. Um, when you get the recording again, as I said, you'll be getting their contact details so you can get in touch with them directly. Uh, for more detailed advice. Um, we do present these webinars every other month so um, and have different subjects each time to try and keep it interesting. If you would like to see um, some, uh, have us talk about a specialist subject, um, then please send me any ideas that you want um, more information on and we will uh, try and get the right speakers to, to talk about the relevant subjects. Um, and also just for information, we will be planning a live landlord event at the end of June um, venue and further details of this will follow. Obviously, all those that are invited today, I think you might be on our mailing list. Um, but please contact me if you don't get updates about um, investment opportunities and our uh, monthly um, newsletters and also blogs and, and anything on new legislation. If you don't get these, please email me and we'll add you to that mailing list. Uh, I think most people do find it very useful. Um, and again, thank you very much for watching. And thank you, Craig and Graham, once again. Um, and we'll see you again um, in a couple of months' time. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.